along a busy stretch of highway seven miles north of Chapel Hill, three roadside workers made a shocking discovery. Fifteen feet off the eastbound lane of I-40, just beyond a guardrail in an overgrowth of weeds lie the badly decomposed body of a young woman. When deputies from the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office arrived, they found the woman unrecognizable. Nude from the waist down other than a pair of socks, a pink sweatshirt depicting three cartoon bunnies was partially wrapped around her neck. No wounds were visible, and an autopsy couldn't conclusively determine the cause of death, though they believed it to be strangulation. For investigators, they had two mysteries to solve. Who had killed this young woman and then dumped her body in this spot where thousands of cars drove by every day? And just who exactly is she? For more than 30 years, those two questions have remained unanswered, but perhaps now, with advancements in technology and the proliferation of social media, someone might recognize New Hope Jane Doe. Perhaps that person is you. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 207, New Hope Jane Doe. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the mysterious, tragic circumstances surrounding the murder of an unidentified woman known as New Hope Jane Doe. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, episode breakdowns, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or by emailing me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. For more than 30 years, the identity of New Hope Jane Doe and that of her killer has remained a mystery. No family has come forward to claim her. No friends have recognized her. Yet, surely somewhere out there, someone is looking for her. Perhaps you might hold the key to unlocking this terrible tragedy that has left a victim silent and nameless for three decades. This is episode 207, New Hope Jane Doe. Each day, Millions upon millions of people climb into their vehicles, drive away from their homes, and merge onto one of 70 primary interstate highways that crisscross the country in a vast network of concrete, steel, and pavement. While for many, the expansion of this system was a necessity, as small towns and cities throughout the country had previously been reachable only via small, poorly managed roads which stretched on through unpopulated and wide-open wilderness, making long trips more complicated and dangerous, others viewed the interstate project as the end of small-town America. Isolated, quiet, backwater communities who stayed mostly closed off to themselves for generations would now be another stop along a massive network ushering millions of travelers right through their towns every day. Chapel Hill is a town which spreads out across three counties in North Carolina, those being Orange, Durham, and Chatham. For the majority of its existence, Chapel Hill and the area surrounding it were constantly growing, although the influx of new residents was more of a trickle than a flood for more than a hundred years. That would change in the 1950s, when the town saw massive growth as the population increased by more than 150%. By the 1980s, Chapel Hill had exploded from 9,000 residents in the 50s to more than 32,000, and there was no indication that it would be slowing down anytime soon. Despite this explosive growth, locals still viewed the area as a quiet, safe community far from the crime spreading through larger cities. That, however, would all change in the fall of 1988. Interstate 40 runs east to west, and the modern incarnation of this highway extends from State Road 117 in Wilmington, North Carolina, more than 2,500 miles to where it terminates in Barstow, California. At the time of the 1988 expansion, many in Orange and surrounding counties were opposed to the expansion, believing the interstate would eliminate the hometown feel and safety of the area by allowing easy access to a location that was once vastly more difficult and time-consuming to locate. At the time, several law enforcement agencies issued reports 
noting their belief that the expansion of I-40 would result in a sharp increase in crime as the area, once more limited in terms of accessibility, would now be just minutes away from three primary interstate exits. Indeed, crime increased in almost every quantifiable category for Orange County in 1989, leading many to feel justified in their fears about what the interstate might bring. Captain Ralph Pendergraff of the Chapel Hill Police Department acknowledged his belief that the expansion would continue to bring a darker element to the area. He explained, quote, It's no longer an isolated area. Our crime rates will rise with the large metro areas near us, end quote. For much of local law enforcement, it wasn't a fear of increasing crime rates, but more a belief that the types of crimes perpetrated would become more foul. Petty theft and the occasional assault would take a back seat to higher profile robberies, abductions, and murders, thought to be in part due to the ease with which someone could now enter and exit the area via the interstate, whereas previous years would have made both entry and escape much more difficult and time consuming. This somewhat isolationist view was supported by several different studies, including one by the State Bureau of Investigation, which concluded that, not surprisingly, the expansion of large highway systems would make it easier for everyone to come to the area, criminal and civilian alike. While the study acknowledged that crime doesn't always come from outside of a community, making the area more accessible would of course invite elements from all ends of the spectrum. District Supervisor Ron Hawley explained, quote, You can be in and out of a jurisdiction in five minutes. The access is easier, and you can hit a development and be long gone. End quote. Now, while crime rates did begin to grow following the extension of I-40, many have pointed out that as any area grows, develops, and sees a population influx, crime rates always increase. The fact of the matter remains the larger the amount of people in one particular location, the more crimes are likely to occur. Any statistician can tell you that. There is no solid future for an expanding city if the goal is to keep the borders locked off from the rest of the world. And while crime rates increased, so did job opportunities, infrastructure expansion, community programs, and many other aspects which transform a small city into a thriving metropolis. You simply can't grow a community while simultaneously trying to remain a hidden gem tucked away from everyone else. Of the millions and millions of people in vehicles which have zoomed along I-40, the vast majority were not criminals out seeking new, formerly isolated spots to pillage. They're just the average commuter, heading off to work, the mall, or wherever the normal course of their life carries them. No different than you or I, they move along these interstates passing countless miles of wilderness and cityscapes that, for the most part, they hardly notice, as their focus remains on the road ahead and the traffic around them. As a listener of this show, surely you've been on an interstate at some point in time and watched the world fly by outside of your window, never knowing what lies beyond that thick tree line, beneath the surface of that roaring river, or behind that seemingly innocuous, endless stretch of guardrail. There is both a sense of wonder and of fear as you move along through unfamiliar areas not knowing what you might find should you take that next exit or pull over to catch your breath, grab something to eat, or rest for the evening. However, for locals who drive these same roads and highways every day, the comfort of the known surroundings adds a layer of security, as we've all been guilty of the same flawed thought. The rest of the world might be a dangerous place, but that kind of stuff doesn't happen here. At some point in our lives, we are all forced to face the truth that nowhere is immune to horrible acts and no city is a bastion of innocence and safety. For many of the residents of Orange County, that terrible revelation became a harsh reality in the fall of 1990. The morning of Wednesday, September 19th, began with a stiff chill in the air. In the pre-dawn hours, temperatures lingered in the mid to high 50s as light winds moved like frigid sheets of air, rattling dying leaves from their precarious perches high above the world. At exactly 7 a.m., the sun gently peaked over the eastern horizon and began its ascension as a long trail of headlights maneuvered the curves and straightaways of I-40. As commuters made their way to work or school, 
Countless vehicles traverse the interchange where the interstate meets New Hope Church Road. Today, designated as Exit 263, the area remains remarkably unchanged from its appearance in the 90s, as it lingers in the sprawling landscape of the town of Hillsboro, the seat of Orange County, tucked between Burlington to the west and Durham and Chapel Hill to the southeast. At approximately 8 a.m., a crew of inmates were delivered to this particular stretch of interstate where they had been assigned to pick up garbage and mow down the tall weeds along the roadside. Just over an hour later at 9.10 a.m., three of these workers were making their way along a grassy embankment adjacent to the eastbound lane when they spotted something in the grass. At first, believing they had found the corpse of a deer, the three men moved closer until they were just feet from the shape described as being three feet from the guardrail and no more than 15 feet from the right lane. It didn't take long for the trio to realize this was no deer, but instead the badly decomposed remains of a human being. Frightened and caught off guard, the three men quickly called for their supervisor, and within minutes, deputies from the Orange County Sheriff's Department were en route to the scene. Arriving at the location along I-40, investigators initially believed it may have been a situation involving a hit and run. However, it didn't take long to rule out this theory as the body was discovered on the opposite side of the guardrail and there was nothing either on the body or the roadway to suggest that a collision with the vehicle had taken place. At the same time, an initial overview of the body didn't supply any solid answers about a potential cause of death either as no gunshot or knife wounds were visible, and the level of decomposition was already so advanced that even getting a solid grasp on the victim's physical appearance was, at that time, nearly impossible. Due to the location and the condition of the body, Orange County Sheriff Lindy Pendergrass ruled that there was a high probability that foul play was involved. While little could be determined about the victim without the assistance of a medical examiner, Sheriff Pendergrass noted that the victim appeared to be a white female with brownish blonde hair that had a red tint to it. Unfortunately, due to the level of decomposition, not a great deal of information could be gleaned from the victim's physical appearance. However, her clothing may offer some clues about her age and perhaps how she had come to be dumped in this out-of-sight location. The victim was nude from the waist down, outside of a pair of white ankle socks which investigators at the time noted as being extremely clean on the bottom. This was an important detail as, given the roadside location, the cleanliness of her socks suggested she had likely worn shoes, which were either yet to be found in the area or perhaps had been kept by the person who had placed her there in the first place. On the upper body was a pink sweater with the image of three bunnies on it. Two of the bunnies were riding bicycles while the third rode a unicycle. The sweater has been described as looking like something a younger person may have worn, not assured investigators would have expected to find a woman in her 20s wearing. While initial reports simply stated that the victim was wearing this pink sweater, later reports went into additional detail and noted that the victim was not actually dressed properly. Instead, the sweater was wrapped around her neck and draped down over the upper portion of her torso leading to speculation that she may have been strangled with that shirt. The victim was wearing a Warner brand bra, size 34 ABC cup. In addition to these clothing items, the victim also wore a thin, yellow, handmade metal ring on her left ring finger. It was later noted that this ring appeared to have originally housed a stone, but when she was found, the stone had either fallen out at some point leading up to or during the dumping of her remains. She also wore a thin, twisted metal bracelet on her left wrist, which has been described as bronze in color. Measurements conducted later determined that the victim would have worn shoes in a women's size 6 to 6.5. She did not have any money, a wallet, or any form of identification. Dozens of investigators were brought to the location over the course of the next few hours as they were moving through the tall grass and weeds surrounding the body in search of additional pieces of evidence or anything which might assist them in determining the victim's identity or any connection to her killer. Unfortunately, it appeared, no additional evidence was recovered, and it was soon determined that the victim had likely been dumped in this location in a hurry and that she may have been lying there for several days 
as the height of the guardrail perfectly obscured her body from the view of passing motorists. Dr. Francis Owl Smith was called in from the medical examiner's office to conduct an autopsy in hopes of determining both the cause of death and, as closely as could be estimated, and age. Dr. Owl Smith noted that the level of decomposition made both determinations difficult to narrow down. X-rays of the body didn't show any type of bone fracture or breaks that would be associated with a physical beating, nor were there any gunshot or knife wounds. No evidence was found that the victim had ever given birth, nor had she broken any bones throughout her life. A toxicology screening came back negative, showing no signs of drugs or alcohol in her system. Due to the advanced decomposition, it could not be determined if the victim had been sexually assaulted. It was later added that the victim's fingers were clean and her nails appeared well manicured. At that time, Dr. Owl Smith reported that an exact cause of death could not be determined, although it was suggested the victim may have been killed via strangulation or perhaps by having her throat cut. In the end, Dr. Owl Smith determined that the victim was likely between the ages of 15 and 25, stood approximately 5 feet 3 inches tall, and weighed around 115 pounds. Based upon the level of decomposition, Dr. Owl Smith noted that she had likely been lying in the spot where she was found for a week, plus or minus two days, giving a range of five to nine days. Additional details released about the victim showed that she had a three-inch scar from an appendectomy. An examination of her dental condition revealed that her wisdom teeth were unerupted, but there were three amalgam fillings, suggesting that at some point in time, the victim had received care from a dentist. In addition to this, three cavities were found, and it was noted that her four lower front teeth leaned slightly backwards toward her tongue. Her lower right canine was described as leaning, overlapping the front of her upper teeth when she bit down. The condition of the victim's teeth was a hot point of debate for some, as many argued she was likely on the lower end of the age range, closer to 15 or 16, due to her wisdom teeth having not broken through the surface. Given that there was evidence that the victim had proper and well-done dental care performed on her at some point in her life, this led investigators to wonder what happened in the time since. The presence of cavities and the uncorrected tilt of her teeth led some to theorize she may have been a runaway or perhaps had gone into foster care or some other situation at some point which resulted in her no longer making regular visits to a dentist. For investigators with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department, they now had two mysteries to try and solve, with limited evidence and clues available. Who exactly was this young woman, and how had she come to die and be disposed of alongside the interstate? As it would turn out, finding one answer without the other proved nearly impossible, and so the primary focus would quickly turn towards identification, with the actual murder itself taking somewhat of a back seat. Investigators believe that unlocking this victim's true name might open up new investigative pathways towards determining the identity and motive of her killer. At that time, Sheriff Pendergrass noted that they would be entering the victim's information into NCIC to try and determine if she had matched up with any known or previously reported missing persons. They would also be going through all local missing persons reports over the previous six months to a year, as there was, and to some degree remains, a strong belief that the victim may have been from the area or the Carolinas as a whole. Asked about their plans, Sheriff Pendergrass told the Chapel Hill News, quote, It may be the individual could be as far away as California or Maine. We've got thousands of things to do. It's going to take weeks and weeks of work unless we have some stroke of luck, end quote. Four days after the discovery of the victim, Sheriff Pendergrass discussed the ongoing investigation. Pendergrass stated that the case was being worked by 10 detectives as well as one detective from the State Bureau of Investigation. They had, at that point, developed 10 leads, all of which were being worked on and included promising information about a woman who had been reported missing from Wayne County, 100 miles to the southeast. Pendergrass stated that as information about the unidentified woman's discovery spread through local and state news sources, they were seeing a large uptick in calls from people who believe they might know the victim or may have seen her in the days and weeks prior to her death. By the end of the day, 
Investigators stated they had narrowed down nationwide missing persons reports to 10 possible identities for the victim, none of which were from the Carolinas. Sheriff Pendergrass explained, quote, We're running down several leads right now, some stronger than others. As far as we can tell, we've eliminated all local possibilities. End quote. While they did have a list of missing women from the state, none of them were reported out of Chapel Hill, Carborough, or Orange County. Pendergrass noted again that since the victim had been found adjacent to the interstate, there was a high probability that she would not have been from the area and could essentially have been from anywhere. Asked about the victim's age, Pendergrass noted, quote, Because of what she was wearing, we suspect that she was at the younger end of that estimate, 15, 16, or 17 years old, end quote. Pendergrass added that in an examination of the jewelry worn by the victim, it showed to be inexpensive, described as costume jewelry. In addition to checking all local and nationwide missing persons reports, which fit the details of the victim's physical description, investigators also reached out to college campuses in the surrounding area and across the state. It was later reported that the victim was not believed to be missing from any particular college or university, as university police had filed no missing persons reports in the months leading up to the grisly discovery. While the investigation was filled with questions that seemingly had no answers, there was one piece of information detectives were certain of. The victim had not been killed where she was found. Her killer had either placed her there or perhaps had tossed her from a vehicle. Pendergrass explained, quote, There's no other way the body could have gotten there unless it was placed there. Had it gone all the way down the embankment, there's a possibility it never would have been found at all. End quote. Three days after the victim was found on Saturday, September 22nd, investigators were already hitting dead ends. A large amount of leads initially called in had been cleared with no solid link to the unknown woman's identity. Several missing women had been ruled out but nothing had yet been found to give any additional assistance to investigators. Sheriff Pendergrass, who had from the very first moments of the investigation believed that this was going to be a difficult case, felt only more strongly that they may never be able to unlock all of the information. Pendergrass told Chapel Hill Herald, quote, We've gotten quite a few calls about this, and we hope that one of the tips will lead us to discovering her identity. This is a tough case. We may never know who she is. We haven't had any lead that has panned out so far, but we're continuing to work hard on this case. End quote. According to Pendergrass, at that point in time, the vast majority of calls they were receiving were not from locals or even people who might have information. Instead, they were dealing with a deluge of calls from other law enforcement agencies across the nation who hoped to determine whether or not the victim might be a missing person from their jurisdiction. While many of these calls opened other possibilities, there was never a solid connection made. Due to the lack of local information, investigators began leaning more heavily towards the likelihood that the victim was not from the area and probably was not from North Carolina, as they could find no reports or missing persons that matched in any way. If indeed the victim was young, Surely a family might be looking for answers, but if they were, they weren't calling about this woman. On Friday, September 28th, nine days after the victim had been found, Orange County officials released a composite sketch which had been created in an effort to represent the face of the unknown woman. The composite ran in local papers and on television news stations, although not everyone involved in the investigation believed the composite was going to be helpful. In the image, the woman appears on the older end of the age range, closer to her mid-twenties, while many investigators felt that the victim was likely younger and that this image would only add confusion to the investigation. During the press conference in which the composite was revealed, Sheriff Pendergrass also noted that they had been contacted by several people who thought they might have seen this woman prior to her death. According to Lieutenant Bobby Collins, a man contacted investigators and stated that he had seen the victim 65 miles to the east at the Archdale truck stop off I-85 at the Burlington Alamance exit on Friday, September 14th, five days before she was found. This man reportedly told authorities that while he couldn't recall the woman's face precisely, it was the pink sweater with bunnies on it that stood out to him. 
Sheriff Pendergrass added, quote, We've talked to some witnesses in Alamance County who, based on the clothing description, think they had seen the girl. They're not positive. All they remember is a pink sweatshirt with rabbits on it. End quote. Unfortunately, investigators were never able to verify whether or not these witnesses did in fact see the victim at the truck stop, nor could they confirm another sighting. Two people contacted authorities to report that they had seen a woman matching the victim's description walking near a Ramada Inn along I-85 near North Carolina Route 62. This location is just north of Burlington and approximately 30 miles from the Archdale truck stop where the previous sighting had been reported. Whether or not the person seen at either location was in fact the unknown woman has never been determined. By the beginning of October, two weeks after she had been found, investigators were starting to lose their initial optimism. Sheriff Pendergrass stated that while they continued to receive leads, they were running them down and eliminating them just as fast as they came in. The sheriff noted that according to his memory, there had never been a body which went unidentified in Orange County. And while he wanted to keep it that way, he couldn't say they were going to be successful this time. He explained, quote, as time moves on, it becomes less and less sure that we'll find out anything. I'd hate to say we don't think we'll find out any more, but we may not, end quote. One week later on Friday, October 12th, the investigation was substantially scaled down. The original 10 investigators and one SBI agent working the case had been reduced to two. With leads beginning to fade and investigators finding themselves no closer to identifying the victim, Sheriff Pendergrass announced plans to bring in a criminologist who would create a facsimile of the victim utilizing her skull to determine possible facial features and shape. Reportedly, the composite had failed to drum up much information and it was believed that creating something substantially more accurate might aid in the process. Pendergrass explained, quote, In a few weeks, we'll try to do a facsimile. We'll take the skull and try to recreate the person's facial image. The chances could be between slim and none until somebody comes up with something that can match up. End quote. Unfortunately, by the end of the month, it appeared the investigation into the unknown woman's identity and murder was no closer to finding any answers. Sheriff Pendergrass noted that if the victim was never reported missing or if she lived a transient lifestyle at the time, identifying her could be nearly impossible. It was the belief of investigators that the victim was dumped by someone passing through. So even trying to answer the question of how she ended up in that spot was an overwhelming challenge. Pendergrass stated, quote, how she got here, that's going to be a hard job to do because she was thrown out. It could have been a tractor trailer passing through, just about anything. There ain't no telling how she got here, where the vehicle was headed, or anything like that. End quote. While October had come to a close for Hillsboro investigators, leaving them in much the same position they had been when the victim was first found, developments in two cases in surrounding areas began to lead detectives to wonder if perhaps Jane Doe's case was not an isolated crime. Police were searching for Kathy Clark Fogelman, who mysteriously vanished on the night of Saturday, November 3rd. The 28-year-old worked weekdays as a data clerk entry for AT&T, and on weekends, she worked as a waitress at the Harbor Inn Seafood Restaurant in Burlington. According to co-workers, Fogelman left the restaurant at the end of her shift around 10.45 p.m. and planned to go home and change before heading out for the night. Though Fogelman was not much of a drinker, she preferred to leave her vehicle at home and often utilized taxis when she went out. On this particular night, Fogelman had planned to stop by the cocktail lounge at a Best Western motel in Burlington, though she never made it. Fogelman had hung out there before, so employees had a level of familiarity with her. When questioned by investigators, no one reported having seen the 28-year-old at the lounge that night. A records check showed that at 11 p.m., a taxi driver employed by the Redbird Cab Company had picked Fogelman up from her Martin Street home after she'd called for a ride to the lounge. Where she had gone from there, no one knew, but investigators were casting a suspicious look at the driver of that cab. Three days later, on Tuesday, November 6th, a hunter stumbled across Fogelman's nude remains in a wooded area between Alamance Church and Mount Hope Church Roads. 
Her clothing was found near her body. While investigators searched in the surrounding area, they found no additional evidence. However, just the next day on Wednesday the 7th, a mother and daughter living nearby decided to search through the location themselves. Walking along McPherson Clay Road, which connects Alamance Church and Mount Hope Roads, the two women entered a wooded area and discovered skeletal remains just 20 feet inside, no more than 500 feet from where Fogelman had been found. The body was covered by a pink quilt, and the feet and arms were bound by rope. The body would ultimately be identified as 41-year-old Pamela Hoy, who had been reported missing on July 25th three and a half months earlier. Hoy was en route to her parents' home in Greensboro, 14 miles to the northeast from where she was found. Four days after her disappearance, Hoy's van was found parked at the Days Inn on Randleman Road in Greensboro. According to initial reports, Hoy was last seen by her estranged husband when the two met for dinner. In a haunting twist of fate, Pamela Hoy was one of the first missing persons considered as a possible match to Jane Doe. While investigators could not link the deaths of the two women, it was considered highly suspicious that their bodies had been found in the same general area. It was noted by several Orange County investigators that while their Jane Doe had been found off New Hope Church Road, these two women were found not far from the interstate and in the vicinity of Mount Hope and Alamance Church Roads. While some believe the similar named roads were a coincidence, others wondered if perhaps it might be the signature of a serial killer. Richard Fry, Alamance County Sheriff, explained to the Greensboro News and Record, saying, quote, We have no idea if there is a connection. We have not tied the two cases together at all. It might be a coincidence that they were near each other. At this point, we have no way of knowing the two are connected. End quote. An autopsy conducted on Fogelman determined that the 28-year-old had been sexually assaulted prior to being killed, and according to that exam, it was believed that she had been murdered when a vehicle ran her over, crushing her chest. Given the information available to them, an arrest warrant for murder was issued for Keith Allen Brown, the man who had been Fogelman's cab driver that night. Aware that investigators were looking for him, Brown attempted to flee, and had last been seen at the Durham bus station early in the morning of Thursday, November 8th. Brown had an extensive criminal history. He had been charged with rape in Alamance County in 1977. However, court records indicated that he had been found not guilty. Four years later, in 1981, Brown offered a ride to a woman walking from a convenience store in Graham, a city in Alamance County. After the woman entered the vehicle, Brown drove her to a secluded location near both North Carolina Road 61 and 62 in Guilford County. This location is less than a mile from where Fogelman and Hoy's bodies were later found. There, he sexually assaulted the woman before stabbing her several times and leaving her for dead. One of the stab wounds had punctured the victim's lung, yet she had the strength and determination to crawl out from that isolated spot. She managed to get to a nearby home, at which time emergency medical services were contacted. The woman survived, and thankfully, since Brown was a fucking idiot as well as a piece of garbage, he had given his real name when he'd first picked her up. Due to his previous arrest, Alamance authorities had his mugshot on file, and the victim positively identified Brown as her attacker. On October 27, 1981, Brown pleaded guilty to assault and common law robbery. The rape charge had been dismissed, with investigators stating that this may have been a result of the victim not wanting to testify against this monster, or perhaps was part of a deal cut by prosecutors. Brown was sentenced to five years in prison, but somehow was released less than two years later on September 11, 1983. According to court records, following his release, Brown wasn't even required to spend any time on probation. James Komen, the prosecutor who had worked the case against Brown, wrote a powerful letter to the North Carolina Parole Commission, objecting to his release and arguing that he should have received a stiffer sentence initially. Unfortunately, his argument was disregarded and Brown was set free. Komen later commented about that situation, saying, quote, I thought he was a danger to society and that he should not be paroled, end quote. 
Additional records showed two trespassing charges issued against Brown in Brunswick County and back in Graham in 1986. However, no further information was available as to the cause of these charges nor the results of any prosecution. In August of 1990, Brown applied for a job with the Redbird Cab Company and was required on his application to list his 1981 felony conviction of assault with a deadly weapon. At the time, he would need a permit to drive a cab, and those permits were issued by the Burlington Police Department. City ordinances noted that a permit may be withheld if the applicant is a felon. However, Brown was granted a permit. Burlington Police Captain John Glenn stated that because the conviction was nine years old and because there were no prior incidents, they issued him a permit. Asked about that ordinance, Glenn told reporters, quote, The word there is may. That's a big word. It doesn't say shall. It doesn't say will. It just says may. End quote. Now, with their curiosity piqued, Orange County investigators began wondering if perhaps Brown may have been responsible for the murder of Jane Doe. If indeed he had, not only would they love to file charges against him, they also hoped that he might know details about the victim, perhaps her name or the area where he picked her up, where she was from. Of course, nothing could be done until Brown was located and brought in. While the possibility lingered, Sheriff Pendergrass was cautiously optimistic telling reporters that while they wanted to speak with Brown, they were not looking at him as a prominent suspect. On Monday, November 12th, Keith Allen Brown was taken into custody following a standoff with police. Investigators received an anonymous tip that Brown was hiding out in a home his family had rented, located at 601 Seymour Road in Graham. Officers from six different law enforcement agencies surrounded the home, and tried to coax Brown out of a ceiling crawl space where he'd attempted to conceal himself. At 6 p.m., officers tried to communicate with Brown through the use of a bullhorn, though he only replied that he was armed, warning that he would shoot himself if police entered the home. They managed to convince Brown to speak with them over the phone, at which time Detective Lieutenant Alan Cates took over. Cates had been involved in Brown's 1981 arrest and knew him. Nearly five hours later, at 10.45 p.m., Brown finally exited the home with his hands raised and was taken into custody. Asked about his conversation with Brown, Cates told the Greensboro News, quote, He kept saying he wanted us to let his wife come in and talk to him. We couldn't do that because it could have created a potential hostage situation. I just used that logic and general conversation. I tried to build enough confidence in him and we stressed that we didn't want anyone else to get hurt, including him, end quote. Neighbors described Brown as the type who kept to himself and wasn't very involved with getting to know anyone in the community. Several people noted that he came and went on a loud motorcycle, wore a leather jacket, and had waist-long hair, which he kept in a ponytail. Police later stated that Brown was a member of the Jackals Motorcycle Club, which, up until a year earlier, had frequently met at a clubhouse in Alamance County. While Brown would be interrogated by investigators in relation to the abduction, rape, and murder of Kathy Fogelman, other agencies sought to question him in regard to the murder of Pamela Hoy. Unfortunately, investigators weren't at that time able to determine the cause of Pamela's death. Alamance County Sheriff Richard Fry noted that they might learn more about these cases, or perhaps ones they were unaware of, saying, quote, Sometimes when you talk to a guy like this, you find out things about other cases, if their conscience gets to them or something, end quote. Brown denied involvement in Pamela Hoy's death, telling the SBI that he had never met Hoy, nor did he have any information about her murder. Things were somewhat different with Kathy Fogelman. Whereas Brown did not directly admit guilt, he also didn't deny it. At that time, Brown told investigators he had no interest in speaking to authorities from Orange County about Jane Doe either. However, Brown later sent word that he would be willing to speak to investigators from the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Two deputies were en route to speak with him when they received word that Keith Allen Brown had taken his own life in his jail cell. What information he may have had in regard to Jane Doe or any other cases for that matter, he took with him to the grave. Unfortunately, this end to Brown's life 
also symbolized a turning point in Jane Doe's case as it began growing cold. As days turned to weeks, weeks to months, and months to years, for many, the plight of the unknown woman began fading from their consciousness. Life moved on, and every day, thousands upon thousands of cars sped down I-40 right past the New Hope Church Road exit, not realizing they were driving less than 15 feet from where the victim had been found. She was ultimately given two separate names by different agencies. Some places refer to her as the Hillsboro Jane Doe, while others call her the New Hope Jane Doe, referring to the interstate exit where she was found. There would not come any additional information, discussion, or insights into the case until nearly 30 years later. 2018 saw a sincere push to try and bring closure to this case, both by identifying Jane Doe and perhaps her killer. A new composite was assembled, giving a much more accurate image of how the victim may have looked in life. Investigators hoped to cash in on the prominence of social media. Sheriff Charles Blackwood explained to WRAL News, saying, quote, We want as many people as possible to see this new picture. Social media wasn't a resource in 1990. Now, it allows us to get her likeness in front of more people than we ever dreamed possible back then. This image needs to reach the right person, the person who knows who this girl was. End quote. In late January, Reporters from WNCN, CBS News, sat down with Troy Williams, an Orange County Sheriff's investigator. Williams acknowledged the lack of developments and news on the case, noting that he had worked as an investigator with the county for 14 years before he even became aware of New Hope Jane Doe. All of that changed when a box of evidence was placed on his desk and Williams found himself in charge of trying to find answers his predecessors had failed to uncover nearly three decades earlier. Inside of the box were investigative files and some of the victim's belongings, notably the bracelet and ring. Williams found himself drawn to the ring, explaining, quote, the fact that it didn't have a stone and that the way it was shaped for her little finger at the time, they thought was very unique. So somebody who knew her would recognize that immediately. The fact that she went away from here only having this, I think, is just heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. Somebody should be able to recognize one of those. Somebody. End quote. During this interview, Williams was able to reveal some details about the case which had not been previously released, as well as clarifying some information that had become obscured over the decades. Firstly, Williams noted, the victim had dyed her hair. She was naturally a brunette, though her hair had been dyed blonde sometime prior to her death, though her roots were showing. Williams also noted that the pink sweater she wore with the three bunnies on it was thought to be a key piece of evidence. Williams explained, quote, We had people from the FBI, the NCIS, we had everybody, and they all said the same thing at the same time. I've never seen anything like that. Somebody has to know where this sweatshirt came from. End quote. As it would turn out, while law enforcement officials never managed to track down much, if any information about the image found on Jane Doe's sweater, several researchers have managed to crack that code to some degree. A researcher on Web Sleuths was able to narrow down the graphic design to an artist out of Michigan. Jim Benton confirmed that the design was his, although he noted that it was not an original work. Benton described the design as being a knockoff of his own specifying that his original piece had more color and his signature was visible. He recollected having created the design in the mid-80s, but there was no way to really narrow down where the victim may have obtained it. Since the original design was for sale in clothing stores all across the country, anyone in any given location could have created the knockoff. Investigator Williams went on to say that, really, the only solid lead investigators had ever had were the alleged sightings of Jane Doe. Williams stated, quote, At the end of the day, when everything was all said and done, that was really the only good lead they had. Because of the circumstances at the time and the area where the witnesses say or may have seen her or observed her, she may have been asking for a ride. It could have been something as simple as, Can you give me a lift? Which turned into, obviously, something very bad. 
end quote. Williams could not rule out the possibility that Jane Doe may have been a sex worker, though he noted that were this the case, it might only make attempts to identify her more difficult. If indeed she was a sex worker, any men or women who may have interacted with her might be less willing to come forward and tell authorities anything they feel they may have learned about her. Especially after such a large passage of time, many people might not want to revisit that time in their life. On top of that, it also widens the possible suspect pool as the suspect may not have needed to abduct her, instead paying her for her services and she willingly getting into the vehicle. Then, of course, there was Keith Allen Brown, the cab driver who had been arrested for Fogelman's murder and considered a possible suspect in the murders of both Pamela Hoy and Jane Doe. Unfortunately, since investigators didn't get to interview him, there's no way of knowing what, if any, information he may have had. And as a result, that was an avenue they lacked the ability to follow any further. Williams went on to say that he hoped to have a new forensic composite put together for the victim. Previously, a clay model was created working from details of the victim's skull, but Williams felt it made the victim look too old and also noted that showing photos of the clay model often made it difficult for people to truly visualize this person. In the files, he located photos of the skull along with x-rays, which were utilized to create an updated, more lifelike rendering of what Jane Doe may have looked like. Williams also discussed a realization he had come to while looking into the case. Previously, everyone who had worked the case had been male. Williams explained, quote, My biggest surprise was at the time, it was only a male perspective. There was no female perspective on what happened to this young lady. Why was she wearing this type of clothing? Why would she wear this dainty little ring on her finger? Why was her hair colored this certain way? What was the mindset of a female? That was one of my light bulb moments. No one ever asked a female. End quote. Asked whether or not he believed this case would ever be solved, Williams was blunt in noting that his primary goal was her identity, saying, quote, I haven't concentrated on who took her life. I've only concentrated on how we can identify this poor young lady. Somebody, somebody has to know who this young lady is. I would really, really love to put a name with this female and bring some closure for someone, end quote. At the time, North Carolina had 120 unidentified cases dating back to the 70s. Unfortunately, while a DNA sample was obtained from Jane Doe, it was North Carolina policy at the time to cremate unidentified bodies, and this was also the case for Jane. Her ashes were spread at sea in line with that policy. The state has since changed the rule, now keeping the cremated remains and oftentimes not cremating them at all. Orange County Sheriff Charles Blackwood asked about the case, noted that investigators now believe the victim's cause of death was absolutely strangulation. He spoke of the urgency to identify the victim as it may be the only way they ever make progress, telling WFMY CBS News, quote, Investigators pursued more than 100 leads, but we still don't know who she is or who killed her. We want to learn who this young woman was and bring her family peace. End quote. Over the years, several names have been considered as possibly having been responsible for Jane's murder. While it is a large list, some of the more notable names include Clark Perry Baldwin, Henry Frederick Wise, and Sean Patrick Goebel in addition to Keith Allen Brown. Baldwin was a long-haul trucker who killed hitchhikers he picked up and disposed of their remains adjacent to interstates. His known victims were killed between 1991 and 1992 in Tennessee and Wyoming. All were killed via strangulation and blunt force trauma, and all were found without their shoes. Goebel was also a trucker, operating out of Asheboro, North Carolina, 60 miles southeast of Hillsboro and just south of Greensboro. Goebel picked up female victims at truck stops and gas stations, killing them via strangulation or suffocation. He would then dump their bodies along the interstate. His known murders took place in Tennessee and North Carolina in 1995. Wise worked as a trucker for Western Carolina Trucking, and lived throughout his life in both Florida and the Carolinas. He regularly drove the I-59 corridor. 
In 1999, Wise, who also worked as a stunt driver, died following an accident at the Myrtle Beach Speedway in South Carolina. He was not linked to any murders until DNA connected him to 19-year-old Stacy Lynn Chahorsky. Chahorsky had gone missing while hitchhiking across the country, making her way towards her home in Norton Shores, Michigan. In December of 1988, Two Department of Transportation workers found her body along I-59 in Dade County, Georgia, approximately five miles from the Alabama state line. Jahorski had been strangled and her body was dumped in a northbound lane of the interstate. Authorities theorized that Wise encountered Jahorski at a truck stop as she was looking for a ride. Wise's DNA was found at the scene, though it wouldn't be until more than 20 years later that police were able to connect him to it through the use of genetic genealogy. It's unknown whether or not Wise committed other crimes, though the smart money says Chahorsky was not his first kill. Unfortunately, they have not been able to link him to any other unsolved homicides. While authorities are unsure whether or not any of these killers may have been responsible for Jane's murder, their primary goal at this time is to uncover her identity. Somewhere out there, a family, a sibling, a friend wonders whatever happened to the vibrant young woman who used to be such a valuable part of their life. This year marked 32 years since New Hope Jane Doe was found just beyond the guardrail along the eastbound lane of I-40 in Hillsboro, Orange County, North Carolina. Tragically, it appears, the unidentified woman has been without a name for a decade longer than she was ever alive. Hillsboro Jane Doe is described as being a white female with brunette hair dyed blonde with a touch of red. Her hair was described as being layer cut to around shoulder length. Jane stood 5 feet 3 inches tall and weighed between 108 and 115 pounds. She has a 3 inch appendectomy scar on her lower right quadrant. When found, Jane was wearing a pink sweatshirt with three bunnies on it, two of them riding bicycles, one on a unicycle. A tag inside of the shirt read, Sportswear. She also was wearing a Warner brand bra, size 34 ABC. She was wearing a pair of white anklet socks, which were very clean on the bottom, and she would have worn a woman size six to six and a half shoe. Two pieces of jewelry were also found on the victim these being a thin yellow metal ring on her left ring finger, which appeared to be handmade and was possibly missing a stone, as well as a thin twisted metal bracelet on her left wrist, bronze in color. Photographs are available showing her jewelry as well as the graphic design on her shirt. In regard to Jane's dental records, her wisdom teeth were reported as being unerupted. Teeth numbers 3, 14, and 19 had amalgam restorations. Teeth numbers 23, 24, 25, and 26 were tilted to the lingual. Tooth number 28 was in a lingual crossbite. This means that her four lower teeth leaned backwards toward her tongue and her lower right canine overlaps in front of her upper teeth when she bites down. There were also cavities found in her teeth numbers 2, 15, and 18. New Hope Jane Doe's body was found in an advanced state of decomposition on the morning of Wednesday, September 19, 1990. Her remains were adjacent to the eastbound lane of Interstate 40 at exit 263 New Hope Church Road. Her body was 15 feet from the right lane, three feet beyond a guardrail which ran for hundreds of feet. Authorities are unsure whether the victim was placed in this location or or if her killer may have thrown her body from a vehicle, either while parked at that location or possibly while in motion. The cleanliness of her socks leads investigators to believe that the killer either kept her shoes as a souvenir or threw them out elsewhere, perhaps at the location where she was killed, which has been confirmed to not be the same place where she was found. While an exact cause of death could not definitively be confirmed, Investigators believe, based upon the condition of Jane's shirt and the absence of wounds, that she was likely a victim of strangulation. Jane is believed to have been between the ages of 15 and 25, though many lean more towards the younger side. She may have been dead for anywhere between five and nine days prior to the discovery of her body, which would suggest she was killed between September 10th and 14th, 
1990. She may have been spotted at an Archdale truck stop or a Ramada Inn in the Burlington area five to seven days before her murder. The condition of her teeth suggests a change in her lifestyle where she was no longer receiving regular dental care, suggesting she may have run away, been abandoned, moved into foster care, or perhaps her family could no longer afford to pay for dental care. While fingerprints are unavailable due to decomposition, DNA is on file and there are photographs of her skull as well as x-rays of her body available. Somewhere out there, there's someone who misses this young woman. She didn't merely spring up from a hole in the earth. She was a daughter, maybe a sister or a cousin, an aunt or a niece. After so long, it's difficult to accept that no one has come forward to report her missing, to present an identity, or to seek out her fate. Recently, as we have seen a massive change to cold cases and unidentified victims thanks to advancements in genetic genealogy, many are eager to see these same techniques applied in this case. 32 years is far too long to go without a name, without a face, without memories, and without answers. Asked about the investigation and the three decades which have passed since Jane Doe was found, Investigator Troy Williams expressed his own frustration and grief, saying, quote, I catch myself wondering how many people, how many people have driven by since then. I thought it was a bit odd that it had been that long that nobody, not one single person, had come forward for this young lady. I'm having an issue knowing that nobody came forward to say, this is somebody to me. The mystery and tragedy surrounding New Hope Jane Doe is something which has sadly been partially lost to time. For a long stretch of time between the early 90s and 2018, there wasn't much mention, if any, of the unknown woman who had been murdered and dumped along Interstate 40 in September of 1990. Seemingly, as law enforcement hit dead end after dead end, shooting down all of their attempts to try and find an identity for the young woman, the case grew cold. And as is usually the case, it faded from the headlines and the investigation went dormant. Like so many Doe cases which remain unsolved, investigators both with law enforcement agencies and those working by the push of their own personal curiosity and hope have continued over the decades to try and find new information and to keep the case alive. Several different composites have been put together in hopes of showing what Jane may have looked like in life. The most recent of these, the 2018 version, is the sharpest, most realistic image of the victim that has ever been released. It's the hope of everyone involved that someone out there might recognize the young woman in the image, and they encourage everyone to share this image and the story of this young woman, as you never know who might see it on their social media feed and have that moment of recognition. Since we don't have a lot to work with here, we can't really do a theory section like we normally would. Given that we have no idea about the victim's identity, where she was from, how old she really was, where she was going, and how she ended up a murder victim dumped along the interstate, we can't really drum up information about potential suspects, motives, or any connections between the victim and killer. While most believe that this was a crime committed at random, Others have thought that perhaps the reason no missing persons report can be found matching Jane Doe is because her killer might have been a family member or guardian, and if they didn't report her missing, whoever would. I don't believe there's much of a point in going down the list of potential killers as there's no solid links between any of them and Jane, nothing outside of the manner in which she was killed or the location where she was found. Obviously, a powerful theory in this case revolves around the idea that Jane may have been killed by a long-haul trucker, someone who passed through the area with some frequency and was familiar with it. One of the keys to this case, which has led many to believe that a trucker was involved, has to do with the condition of Jane Doe's socks. It was noted that her socks were white, anklet style, and when she was found, the bottoms were notably clean. Since we know her body was placed there by her killer, she wouldn't have been walking around the roadside in her socks anyway. However, the absence of shoes leads many to believe that one of two situations occurred. 
Jane was killed elsewhere and her shoes were either off at the time or came off during the murder. Then her killer would have either kept them, possibly as a souvenir, or disposed of them before moving her body or after. Many people have pointed out that a lot of truckers, when offering someone a ride, might request that that person remove their shoes as to not dirty up the cabin. Others have pointed out that if the victim had traveled with the trucker for any period of time, he may have required that she remove her shoes before entering the sleeper part of the trailer. The only thing we really know for sure about the victim's socks is that she clearly wasn't wearing them for an extended period of time, nor did she walk around without shoes on. Considering a lot of people who theorized that the victim was a runaway, it seems odd that if she were living a transient lifestyle that her socks would have been so clean. This, of course, ignores the possibility that the victim may have been traveling with extra clothing, perhaps a bag or a suitcase, something that the killer could have gotten and kept or tossed out somewhere down the line. The sweater worn by Jane Doe has gotten a lot of attention from those who have tried to unravel this mystery. The pink color and cartoonish childlike design of the bunnies on bicycles and a unicycle leads many to believe that the victim had to be closer to the younger end of the estimated age range. Detectives don't find it plausible that a woman in her mid-20s would still be dressing in clothes which clearly targeted an audience of younger teenagers. Of course, without knowing anything about the victim, it's entirely possible that she was wearing what clothing she had access to and perhaps the sweater was grabbed at a Goodwill or a flea market type store. Online sleuths managed to track down the man who had originally designed the bunny graphic. Jim Benton confirmed that the image was based on his work, though he specified that it was not an original. His work had more colors, and his signature would have been included. This suggests that the sweater was likely printed up and either sold or given away to the victim at any number of locations where this kind of thing happens. I know when I was a kid, we frequently shopped at a local flea market where they would screen print knockoff designs right there in front of you. Surely something like that could have happened with this sweater. Unfortunately, since the design was sold in clothing stores all over the country, it's impossible to narrow down exactly where this shirt may have been procured. So it sort of becomes a problem of If the victim acquired the shirt at a secondhand shop somewhere or maybe in a shelter or someplace she had gone seeking help while being a transient, there's no direct link between the victim, the shirt, and any specific location. Surely she could have gotten it anywhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be the only shirt she was in possession of. Unfortunately, unless someone sees that logo and remembers a store that sold that exact design printed on sportswear brand sweaters, I don't know that the shirt is going to lend much assistance in answering this mystery. Looking at the victim's jewelry, there isn't a lot to say here either. The bronze-colored bracelet which was found on her body doesn't seem to have any qualities which really make it stand out. There's no brand names, no serial numbers, nothing that would make the item traceable, and according to investigators, it was not an expensive piece. It's costume jewelry, likely cheaply made and mass-produced, the kind of thing a younger person might purchase. The ring, however, that one is a very curious piece. Firstly, while detectives have said the ring appears to be missing a stone, honestly, from my look at it, I kind of disagree. The space where they believe a stone existed has no teeth and doesn't really show any signs that a stone had ever been there. Investigators also stated that they believe the ring was homemade. However, I'm not sure I agree with that either. The ring, made of a yellow metal, very closely resembles what you might refer to as a wire ring. You can find these for fairly cheap in touristy spots and in department store costume jewelry sections. It's a thin metal ring which forms a circle, and then the two ends are connected where the metal takes on a shape. In this case, that shape is a circle. However, I've seen similar rings where the connection is shaped to be a heart, a bow, or a cross. It's a very unique but not necessarily easily identifiable piece of jewelry as there are many variations of rings in this style. Given that it's yellow metal and not gold or some type of fine jewelry material, I don't know that this is going to provide any solid leads. While I can understand believing this was something uniquely designed for Jane Doe, I've seen a lot of this style of ring over the years and it's somewhat in line with the bracelet. 
a piece of jewelry that someone younger might have worn. We know the victim was naturally a brunette, but had dyed her hair blonde, and there may even have been a slight tint of red, as initial reports describe the victim as strawberry blonde. At the time, it was fairly common for darker-haired women to dye their hair blonde or to get it frosted or highlighted. It's just a sign of the times in the early 90s. That being said, you have to wonder about the dye job itself. Had the victim dyed her hair before she ultimately disappeared and wound up on the side of I-40, or was it something done when she was on the road, perhaps to make herself appear older or to partially obscure her identity? New Hope Jane Doe holds a myriad of contradictions. She wears a shirt that would have been worn by a child, jewelry which is cheaply made or inexpensive to acquire, anklet socks, and a size 34 ABC bra. All of these seem to suggest her age is closer to 15 than it is to 25. However, we've got the dyed hair, well-manicured fingers, a history of dental work, and an appendectomy scar. Clearly, at some point in time, this woman was in a situation where she had access to both dental and medical care, which was carried out with a degree of precision, suggesting that she didn't attend low-quality, cheaper medical professionals, but likely ones which were in higher standing. So, how does she go from having access to these options to seemingly being out on her own? The smart money says that she had a family at some point in time, maybe just a single parent, maybe raised by grandparents, but there was someone looking after her in the first part of her life. In a lot of cases like these, we come to find it goes one of two ways. Either no one reports the victim missing because they don't know she's missing and close family members have passed away, or they don't report her missing because they aren't sure she's actually missing. We've seen a lot of cases where the person was not reported missing, either because they were assumed to have run off or because they had some kind of a clash in their life where their familial connections were severed. Usually when this happens, you're looking at someone a little older, but here we have this young woman between 15 and 25. Surely someone noticed when she vanished. If she saw a doctor, if she went to the dentist, I have to believe she attended school for some period of time. She must have made friends, acquaintances, known teachers. Someone should remember her. So if you push everything aside that we can't know, let's just take a look at what we do know. The victim was found on the morning of Wednesday, September 19th. The medical examiner determined that based on the level of decomposition, she'd been lying where she was found for anywhere between five and nine days. This means the victim was killed sometime between Monday the 10th and Friday the 14th. The 14th is an interesting date as it lines up with the witness who claimed to have seen her at the Archdale truck stop. This means that five days before her body is found, she may have been seen within 60 miles from where she ended up. If indeed the witness was right and she was hanging around a truck stop, that would supply more strength to the theory that her killer may have picked her up as she sought a ride, possibly a trucker or just someone who traveled a lot for work. So if you lay this out on a map, the truck stop location as well as the Ramada Inn where others claim to have seen her are both to the northwest of where she was found. This may indicate that when seeking a ride, Jane was heading east or southeast, possibly towards Chapel Hill, Raleigh, or further into South Carolina, Georgia, and beyond. While her body was found 15 feet from the eastbound lane, I-40 has a lot of areas where it curves north and south, and this particular area, the eastbound lane, is actually heading south before it makes a wide sweep east near the town of Eubanks, five miles south from the New Hope Church Road exit. Now again, we hit the same problem. We don't know if the victim was actually traveling in this direction or if once her killer got her inside his vehicle, he simply took her where he wanted to. Given that no evidence at the scene could be found to suggest that she had been killed there, you're now trying to solve a homicide without a direct murder scene. On the other hand, it's very difficult to dismiss from your mind that that cab driver who killed Kathy Fogelman, Keith Allen Brown, lived in Graham and picked up at least one victim from the Graham area. Graham is just south of Burlington, along I-40, and is just 20 miles west from where Jane Doe was found. Coincidence? Maybe, 
but hard to ignore when Jane was killed after Pamela Hoy, but only weeks before Kathy Fogelman. At the end of the day, this is a case which is not going to be solved without the involvement of the public. Concerned citizens, curious sleuths, and online researchers may hold the best potential for bringing this case to a conclusion outside, of course, of the amazing work which can be done via genetic genealogy. Digging into the case, researching the details of her body, her clothing, her jewelry, and her medical and dental records might shake something free or at least point in a direction. Sharing the forensic images, details of her case, the story of her death might result in someone remembering something they haven't thought of in more than 30 years. Sadly, while no family members have ever come forward and no one has ever offered a solid link between Jane Doe and any other person, there are countless thousands who have been moved by her story and continue to try and keep her name and image in the public sphere. Web Sleuths has an active thread about this case, and many of the commenters have gone above and beyond to try and unlock the mystery of her identity. In fact, it was a Web Sleuth poster who discovered the origin of the bunny graphic on her sweater, and her new forensic images were worked on by a Web Sleuths user. Reddit is flush with threads about this case, trying, as always, to get her image and details out to that one person who might finally recognize her. Beyond that, there's a Facebook page entitled, Who is New Hope Jane Doe? This page is run by a volunteer who learned about Jane's case and felt a strong emotional connection to her cause. She created the page in hopes of gathering information, sharing the story, and bringing the details to those who may never have known about it. I'll provide a link to that page in the show notes, as well as one to the website where I plan to display all of the photos of Jane, her clothing, and her jewelry. Oftentimes, when I cover a case, I figure there's a fairly limited likelihood that a listener may actually hold the answers. But this case is different. Someone surely knows who this young woman is, and it only takes a second to take a look. Perhaps your quick glance might translate into awakening a long-forgotten memory a relative who vanished years ago, a friend who was there one day and gone the next. Without some information from the public, this case will likely never be solved. Even through the use of genetic genealogy, they may finally be able to unlock Jane's true name. That, however, is but one step on the pathway towards delivering justice to Jane and her family who, all these years later, may assume she simply didn't want to associate with them any longer, when in reality, she could have just as easily been trying to make her way home. Regardless of her origin, New Hope Jane Doe deserves to have her name returned to her, for her family to be able to finally mourn her, and for her killer to be identified and brought to justice. Without new information, however, someone coming forward, or Jane's identity being unlocked, the true name of Jane Doe and the identity of her killer, as well as the circumstances which led to her death, will remain open, unsolved, and growing cold. If you're looking for more information about New Hope Jane Doe, there are many websites and news articles discussing her case. Both the Chapel Hill News and Greensboro News and Observer provided the most detailed coverage. Jane Doe's case is listed on the Doe Network, where she is labeled 558-UFNC. There is also a NamUs entry for Jane, where she is listed as UP-2224. NamUs also lists 25 comparisons which have been ruled out. There is also a Facebook page entitled, Who is New Hope Jane Doe? If you have any information about the identity of New Hope Jane Doe, her killer, any of her clothing, jewelry, or you believe you may have known her, no matter how small your belief, please reach out to law enforcement. You never know how small of a detail might be the key to everything. If you have any information, please contact the Orange County Sheriff's Office at 919 919- 644-3050. Her case number is 90-12532.
You can also submit information anonymously via Crime Stoppers by calling 919-996-1193 or by visiting p3tips.com. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to thank our very amazing Patreon producers. Thank you to Alicia Townsend, Amy Guthrie, Andrew Guarino, Ann Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Buttram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloanne Meyer, Fabulous TT, Greg, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkowitz, Julie Mangano, Kara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fengel, Leslie B, Marla Wright, Melissa Breckeisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Quinn McBreen, Sarah Lyons, Susie the Cutie, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tiffany Nelson, Tom Archer, and Tom Radford. Thank you so much for your amazing support. Without you, this show would not be possible. If you're interested in learning more about this case or other cases featured on the show, please visit trace-evidence.com. There you can find case breakdowns, all social media links, merchandise shops, case descriptions, media, and options for donating, including PayPal and Patreon, should you wish to support the show. This concludes this week's coverage of New Hope Jane Doe. I truly believe that someone out there holds the answers to this mystery, and all it's going to take is one phone call, one email, one anonymous message, and you could help restore a name lost nearly 30 years ago. If you don't want to get directly involved, email me from any throwaway email address and I'll pass the information on to law enforcement. But it's time for this young woman to have her name restored. I want to thank you all again for listening. And I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.